This is ContactTalkRadio.com. Consciousness in action. And you are taking action into your consciousness by tuning into Contact Talk Radio. And on TuneIn.com, Hing.fm, and Upsnap Mobile. Contact Talk Radio. Welcome to Living Fearlessly with your host, Lisa McDonald. My mama told me when I was young, we're all on superstars. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so very much for joining me, rejoining me here again on this lovely Friday morning. My name is Lisa McDonald. This is my show, Living Fearlessly with the Contact Talk Radio Network. Listenership spans to 145 countries, 220 TV radio terrestrial satellites, and the potential for millions of iTunes downloads. Once again, I am joined by yet another phenomenal guest. My guest today is named Keith Perrin. And before I turn it over to unscripted dialogue, as I always do with my guests, I'm just going to plug a little bit about who Keith is, given how expansive and far-reaching the listenership is. So who is Keith Perrin? Well, what I can tell you about Keith is that he is an accomplished, well-known entrepreneur who successfully introduced FUBU The Collection, a game-changing apparel brand that currently reports over $6 billion in retail sales to date. As Vice President and Director of Marketing, Keith was the point person who placed FUBU in dozens of music videos, photo shoots, concerts, TV appearances, and movies. His relationship with music artists and dozens of celebrities is on a first-name private access basis that has been the mainstay of FUBU's strategy for years. In his role, he also was the point person dealing directly with the key retail accounts that were FUBU's primary sales outlets. He and his three partners, Damon John, Carl Brown, and Jay Alexander Martin, realized extraordinary celebrity and literally changed the way business viewed the role of young multicultural entrepreneurs throughout America. In recognition of Keith's contributions to the fashion industry and his business management skills, he has been honored with many prestigious awards, including the Ernst & Young's Entrepreneur of the Year Award, 2003, Crane's Business of 40 Under 40 Award, 2004. Keith grew up in Queens, New York, and through the wise upbringing and encouragement of a single-parent mother, he began working when he was 14. By 18, he had established himself in New York's real estate market, first working for New York's housing and urban development office, then as a rental agent, and finally as property manager of a 200-unit Harlem complex, the youngest manager in the company. His work in the fashion industry has taken him to a number of continents such as Asia, Europe, Africa, and South America. Keith has worked well with such well-known fashion brands as Kappa, Ted Baker, Coogie, Married to the Mob, Heatherette, and Drunken Monkey. He's also the brand manager of Celebrity Integration for the Shark Group. One of Keith's main responsibilities is connecting celebrities and influencers with the company's Damon John Invest and in building a valuable relationship. FUBU, the collection, became the first recipient of the Essence Achievement Award given to a company, and in 2004, the FUBU Partners owners were the first to receive the Asper Award for Global Entrepreneurship from Brandeis University. Keith is an excellent public speaker and has been the key speaker in colleges, high schools, corporations, boys and girls clubs, and has appeared on and addressed groups including the Judge Hatchet Show, various news programs, BET, and the Montel Williams Show. Keith's approachable personality has made him a well-known and widely liked figure in the fashion and entertainment industry. He is an honorary member of the Phi Beta Sigma fraternity. Even with a very busy schedule, Keith manages to give back to his community and assist those who are less fortunate by his charitable donations, mentoring, and time. As a founding member of the worldwide brand FUBU, the collection, Keith continues to pioneer new ventures in a quest to ensure urban lifestyle maintains its grip on society. FUBU Radio is his newest project, and it is hot. Keith is the CEO and GM of the station, where he oversees the administrative and business functions of the station. Launched December 24, 2015, FUBU Radio has a scintillating concept to promote the best of our past while celebrating the possibilities of our future. It's a bridge to what made us who we are and what we are evolving into as a progressive society. It is truly a celebration of the best in urban life, culture, and community. Keith says, because of my dissatisfaction with today's current radio programming, I wanted something more exciting to listen to. Every day you hear the same songs played on radio all over the country. I wanted to hear songs from back in the days of our era that don't play anymore on current radio playlists. 
Today, FUBU Radio plays the best of old school hip hop and R&B. The playlist features the best hip hop classics from 1990 to 2006 and R&B from 1990 to 2016. FUBU Radio also showcases amazing mixes from the hottest DJs in the country. Additionally, FUBU Radio will feature on air personalities later this year. Hot topics will include everything from current events, celebrity rumors, comedy, fashion, relationship advice, and more. To connect with the hottest station in urban life, check out www.fuburadio.com. Wow, what a repertoire. Welcome, Keith. How are you? Hey, Lisa. How are you? I'm good. I, I, you know what? I needed a glass of water during that. that that's your accomplishments. <laughs> your accomplishments are stellar. What a leader you are. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Well, on behalf of everybody who has not only purchased your products and your services, I want to thank you for everything you do behind the scenes to, uh, you know, help prop other people and help them make their mark in this world and for being a mentor to so many people. What a lovely attribute. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you. I try to, you know, I try to put in, leave my mark, as they say, you know. Absolutely. So why don't we start, Keith, uh, again, unscripted dialogue. I'm always interested with my guests. The first thing I always like to know is the inception of the journey, the backstory behind the story, what everybody would know and glean from your success to date. So Mm -hmm. how did this all begin for you? How did you get the vision or how did you know this is the path that you were meant to to get on? Well, you know, like early on, as you said, I was I was actually a property manager at the time. um, And uh, I thought, uh, real estate and the housing market was going to be my path since I was doing that for so many years. But um, I was also working with uh, Damon, and he actually came up with the idea um, in our early 20s, <clears throat> excuse me, and he was like, you know, I have this idea. Um, I need, you know, I need your help and, and the help of Carl and Jay to kind of get this thing going if we're going to make it happen. And, um, you know, we tried to launch it a few times, and it, it you know, we just didn't have the funds or the resources to to do it correctly. So we um, we spent a lot of money trying to figure it out when you know when we didn't know what we what we were doing. So, um, mm-hmm. but that that set us up for 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 more success in the long term because you know making those mistakes early on taught us how to you know kind of zig when other people were zagging as we like to say, and uh, <laughs> not kind of do the same thing that everybody else is doing. Because, you know, in this in this situation, in this field, rather, you know, once you come out with something and everybody wants to kind of jump on a bandwagon, and um, we felt we were, we, we had something that was new, and, and um, you know, it just was a, not a not a, a need. Well, not, I wouldn't say a need. It was a need for it, but it wasn't anybody servicing that need. So when we launched it um, in early 1992, um like I said, having not having the knowledge to do it properly, it took us about four years to kind of get it right. Um, luckily for us, we had good friends like Hype Williams, who's a well-known um, director. Um, you know, we had people in our neighborhood, celebrities, Buster Rhymes, Nas, 50 Cent, um, Son Pepper, LL, mm-hmm. of course, Run DMC. You know, we had all these people who you know, grew up around us and that would support us. So we actually looked bigger than what we were at the time. But, um, you know, through persistence and dedication and hard work, we were able to get over the hump and, and uh, we uh, got to a point where we were able to get up the nerve to ask LL to uh, take a picture for us. <laughs> and he wound up doing it. And um, if you look closely, if you can find the picture, uh-huh. We like had a garbage bag with us, and the shirts are all balled up, and his <laughs> shirt is wrinkled. <laughs> we had no stylus to like steaming out anything; it was just so raw, and, and that's what I love about back then. But um, you know, he took he took the shirt and he put it on, and then um, he was on his way to L.A. and he said, you know, hurry up, uh, I gotta go take the picture. If this thing, you know, I'm gonna help you guys. If this thing turns out to be anything, I want you guys to to compensate me because I have a lot of companies, you know, Nike was on the table, Timberland was on the table. So he had major companies willing to work with him and at the time, you know, he was hot. So so he uh he he took the shirt, put it on and Damon took the picture and the rest was history. And after that wow. we we kept going and going and going because we didn't still didn't have any money just because he took a picture with the shirt on, didn't put any <laughs> any funds in our pockets. So we just kept going and going and, and figuring out like, hey, 
we have a, a, a nice little thing we're working out with the videos. And I don't know if you remember, but back then in, on, you know, the early 90s, MTV started blurring out, blurring out all the logos in the videos. Yes. Right? So we were the reason why they started that. Because <laughs> they kept seeing this FB pop up on every video, and they were like, what the hell is this FB? Who is it? What, are, are they paying us to advertise? Like, they're getting free advertising here? And then they start blurring it out. And once, once they started doing that, you know, we were like, oh, man, what, what are we going to do now? Um, luckily, BET at the time was also coming up, and they didn't blur us out. So if you go back and look at a lot of the old BET videos, like we're plastered all over those videos. But um, you know, just doing that and keep and and and, and we kept going. Samsung finally, you know, actually we went to uh, Magic um, one year with our pieces, and uh, we wrote three hundred thousand dollars in orders. Mm-hmm. And uh, came back, and everybody was excited. We were jumping up and down in the house because you have to understand we we were laying a lot of groundwork, but nothing was uh, manifesting <laughs> into anything. You yes. know, whatever we made, we had to kind of turn it back over into the company. And you know, we do that. We did that for like four years. So I always ask people, like, can you work for four years without getting paid? And <laughs> I've not gotten a single yes yet. So, <laughs> but um, you know, we kept doing it and doing it, and then. Uh, once he came back, we figured out, okay, now we have $300,000 in orders. We only have $1,000 in the bank. How the hell are we going to make all this product to even get this money in our pockets? And then uh, Damon Mother saw us sitting there kind of like trying to figure it out. And then she was like, hey, listen, won't you guys just put an ad in the New York Times? And we were like, Brilliant. okay, what are we going to say? <laughs> what are we going to do? <laughs> like we had no type of marketing skills. So she said, um, she said, you know what, just say I got a million in, a million dollars in orders and need financing. And that's what Damon did. He put that order in, and then you had all these people calling us, uh, you know, these mobsters calling us, a lot of these <laughs> sharks in the business, and a lot of these no-good guys in the fashion industry who, who like to take companies from people. Those were, like, some of the first people that called us. And then we got a call from Samsung, America. Wow. And we went, well, we actually got a, a call from one of the guys who worked there, um, he had his own company, but he worked at Samsung America. He heard about us, and he just kind of called us and set up a meeting. So we thought everything was like, we were like, okay, now we're about to, it's about to go down. Like We're really about to get paid. We went to the meeting. Nothing, you know, manifested out of that. He just said, you know, well, good luck, good work, and um, we'll, we'll talk soon. So mm-hmm. we came back. Um, Damon actually went to that meeting um, by himself that day. So cause we were all working on something to get ready for a video, so we he had to go by himself. So when he came back, he was like, you know, the meeting went okay. The guy said he's going to call us. And, you know, we were, like, hanging on to his every word, like, oh, did he say he's going to give us some money? He was like, no, you know, we just got to keep going, man. We just got to keep doing it. it. It'll happen. It'll happen. And then he was really instrumental in um, – and keeping our hope alive because, you know, you're working for four years on a project that's bringing in no money. You, you know, yeah. you, you know, you're close, but you just don't know how close you are. Mm-hmm. And, um, we, uh, I remember picking up the phone one day for, um, one of the rap groups called Onyx and, uh, the lead, uh, the lead rapper in there, his name was Fredro. He called us and said, Hey, I'm shooting this, um, TV show called New York Undercover. I need some clothes. So I'm going to stop by and pick up some things. I was like, okay, come through. And when he came by, he picked it up. He, you know, went on set, and there was a scene with him um, getting shot in one of our shirts. And when I tell you this was a 30-second commercial for free on on live TV, on national TV, you know, it took him about 30 seconds to die when he got shot. And all you saw was food all over the screen. And we were sitting there, like, all our eyes were, like, bulging out of our heads. And like, <laughs> Oh my God. Oh my God. We're on TV. Like, this is not a video. This is like real TV. And we were just so hyped about that. And then, um, it wound up having, um, it wound up, my guy had seen it that we had a meeting with one of my partners. He actually saw that and was like, okay, you guys are still out there doing your thing. I want you come, why don't you come back for another meeting? And then when we went back up there, the deal got done. Yeah, it's awesome. had a new text, textile division. And they were um, they were interested in picking up you know new lines, and they mm-hmm. said, hey, we'll give you this deal, and you know 
you got to make $5 million the first three years or we're going to take the mark or you're going to have to pay us back. So we were like, okay, you know, we're just going to work hard and we're going to make this happen. So being that we planted a lot of seeds throughout those four years, we did a lot of shows, a lot of trade shows, you know, local trade shows, Mm -hmm. and um, people couldn't find it. So when it was finally available in stores, our first season, our first, you know, fall season that we were out, we wound up doing $5 million, a little over $5 million. Wow. Wow. And then the second season, we did like $30 million. And then we were like, okay, we're off and running. So it's like, just <laughs> to go. And then, you know, that's pretty much how it started. Well, I love the story. And there's so many things that simultaneously came to my mind. So, one, you know, I bet you're thanking yourself now that you all stayed the course and that you never gave up. And, you know, involved with that as well, the thought that comes to mind is do you think at any point, um, because we have a lot of entrepreneurs. I'm an entrepreneur, but if it weren't mm-hmm. for the fact that there was more than just yourself, do you think that for the journey it, you would have maybe packed it in and said, "Oh, this is just way too much. It's too cumbersome. It's too, it's not realistic. It's not practical." Or do, did you all have the joint belief and feeding off of each other and that energy and that belief in self? You, you knew it. Would, you were going to get there. No, you know what? It, it actually took uh, a, a little coaching from uh, Mr. Damon John. <laughs> yeah. He was uh, kind of like the leader, and he saw us, you know, putting in 100% and not really getting anything out. And he was like, okay, I know we're close. I know we're close. And he read this book, um, Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow Rich. Yes, yes. And he was like, like I want to say around the third year, but like maybe a little, little past the third year, when everybody was like, yeah, you know, I'm tired, man. I don't feel like boxing no damn clothes at night. <laughs> I want to go to sleep. <laughs> he was just like, okay, how can I, how can I rile these guys up? And he wound up buying. He went to the store and bought all of us, um, thinking we're rich. And he was like, yo, I just read this book. Yo, it inspired me so much. I need y'all to read this book. Like, really read the book and, and, and see if we can apply it to what we're doing. And, and we all read the book and we were, you know, one, one thing in the book that stuck out to me, um, which I always kind of quote from time to time, is there's a, there's a part in there that says, um, you never know how close you come to success because you often quit and fail. Yeah. And that kind of like stuck because it was like, okay, we see the impact that we're having at these trade shows. Like we're taking like 5,000 shirts to a trade show that that's four days long and we're selling out in one day all over the place, like, you know, Atlanta, Philadelphia, New York, D.C., like everywhere we would go, it would just it would just sell out. And we were like, wow, you know, in a couple of places we had to, you know, in New York a couple of times, we had to actually, Damon had to actually go back home and make more shirts while we stayed at the convention center selling, you know, what we had left. And then he would come back, and you know, with new shirts. And, and it was crazy. But, you know, sometimes we went out of town, it wasn't enough. It wasn't, you know, we weren't able to do that. So we would sell out in one day and then we would just be there like, okay, well, let's look at the rest of the, the convention and see what's going on. But uh, I think that book, we all read it and that book um, really got us over the over the hump because, like I said, we knew we had something, mm-hmm. but we just didn't know how close we were, you know. And I always tell people that, like, sometimes you, you know when to pack it in. It's just a, <laughs> it's just a feeling like some people – what they don't do is they don't do their homework. And I've, I've realized over the years when anytime I wanted to start something or do something new, I always did my homework. I always found, you know, a way yep. to figure out, you know, who's in this lane, you know, how many people are in this lane, who's doing mm-hmm. well in this lane, you know, what what are they doing that's different from what I want to do. And, you know, it, you know, and just kind of put down the uh, – it doesn't have to be a, a – a business plan, but it just has to be some type of blueprint on, on, you know, where you want to do, where you want to go and how, how you want to get there. Um, and how fast you want to get there, you know, certain goals that you, you put out for yourself. But, um, well, let me ask you this. Let, let me uh-huh. ask you this, Keith. You know, a lot of people who I interview on radio, fellow entrepreneurs, authors, speakers, uh, mentors, coaches, uh, famous mm-hmm. musicians, you name it. You know, a lot of people, there seems to be a bit of a, there's a lot of crossover and there's a lot of parallels between my guests, including what resonates with me in terms of my own story as well. And a lot of people say, 
that what people would glean as the claim to fame and the, their name now becoming recognizable in household, you know, that all got birthed out of the fuck it moment. You know, when you reach the wall, you hit the wall and you say, I am hungry. I am desperate. I, I can't sit in this space anymore. I need more. I want more. I deserve more. And uh-huh. the vision, the vision, you know, tangibly over time and through grind and hustle eventually comes to fruition. So, you know, had the, had you all had a fuck it moment or uh, had you all been in, sitting in a certain space outside of just wanting to manifest and, and visualize and blueprint uh, your journey, you know, was there dire straight circumstances going on? Was there something that catapulted you into, no, we got to play a bigger game here? Um, I just think that, the, you know, the, it was, like I said, the work that we put in, the, mm-hmm. the, the clothes started to move. The only thing that really kept us, I guess, like mystically in it was that every time we made something, it just literally blew out, like literally just took off and, and it was gone. And we were like, okay, imagine if we had money. Imagine <laughs> we could make, uh, you know, 5,000 of these pieces. How how fast would that go? Can we Can we still do the same thing? Um, we, you know, the, I'll, I'll tell you a little story. You know, everybody sees our logo, 05, that we put on all our stuff. There was five members. If you know, it's only four members now. You know, you know, you never see the fifth member. He had a fucking moment. <laughs> and he just, he just was like, you know, this thing is not working. You know, we've been doing this for four years. And then his girlfriend was like, you know, I want you to come with me over here. You don't need to stay here and work. And then we were like, and then all of us are sitting in there. Like, you got David at the sewing machine. Like, I'm packing boxes or I'm folding shirts. And then <laughs> Carl is loading up the van because, you know, he, me and him would kind of deliver the stuff different times. And, you know, like, all of us are in there now. We're all working regular jobs, you know. Um, but Damon, and then this is another re- another thing that, that kind of took us over the edge. Damon was like, I need you guys to quit your job (laughs) and do this full time. (laughs) So we're looking at him like, dude, we ain't make a dime here yet. (laughs) We understand that this thing might take off, Uh but you want us to quit our jobs? That's what funding us to give you a hundred percent. How are we going to survive? And then he was like, once you quit your job, it's going to take off. <laughs> like he just, And we're looking at him like, David, for real, like, come on, dude. Like, you know, yeah. so at the time I had I had just had a, a, my, my daughter at the time. So mm-hmm. I knew that I had to provide for my daughter. So I was kind of getting tired of my property manager job. It was just, you know, it was just stressing me out a little bit. And um, I was really getting into it with the, the company politically and, and, and trying to, trying to advance and them trying to hold me down. And it was just going a whole bunch of stuff going on. So I was like, you know what? I just want to just do this thing full time, but I don't know how to do it. So I wound up getting fired instead of, um, <laughs> instead of quitting. <laughs> so I could get unemployment because I was making a pretty good, decent amount of money. I had, I was making almost like, I was making like $49,500 at the time. And I was only like twenty. Four, twenty-five years old. Good for you. So Good for you. I was, I was, I was making a decent amount of money. So I was like, I'm making much, I'm making more money than all of them in the house. And I'm like, I don't know if I want to quit my job, but you know. So I wound up getting getting fired and getting unemployment. So that that allowed me to still pay my rent and still be able to do what I need to do and take care of my my daughter. And then literally, when everybody quit their jobs, this thing took off. Yeah. It literally took off, <laughs> but we had to give it a hundred percent. So sometimes I tell people when I speak is, you know, don't do anything less than a hundred percent if you want it to be successful, because, you know, if you're only giving it 50% of your time, then it's not going to, it's not going to go anywhere. You know, it's going to just take Absolutely. you longer to get to your, to your, you know, your goal. So. Absolutely. And you got to be all in because if you're not all in and, and, you know, which is all indicative of to the degree that you believe in yourself and your goals and your, yeah. your dreams, no one else is going to buy into your message. No one's going to buy into your brand if, if you're not putting it out there and you're going full throttle every single day. So, and certainly quitting jobs or getting fired will, will trail the blaze pretty quickly. <laughs> Light a fire. In the <laughs> yeah. You, you, your stomach start hurting. You got Absolutely. enough food in your house, dude. You'll figure it out quicker. 
Absolutely. So, you know, what, what do you believe are the essential core ingredients to be a true authentic leader? You know, because it's become a bit of a catchphrase and there's different uh, levels and different interpretations and different examples out there on the stage of what embodies a leader. But in your definition, and clearly you are uh, a leader yourself, Keith, but, you know, who do you think and, and what kind of uh, essential core ingredients do you think embodies a true authentic leader in today's day and age? You know what? Um, a leader, you know, he has to lead by example. He or she. Lead by, he or she leads okay. by example. Uh-huh. Um, you know, you have people out here who, who I, I call it bo- the boss uh, mode. You know, as soon as you get a title of any significance, you get this little chip on your shoulder that now you're the boss and you can do this and you can do that. And you're taking on that persona as a, as opposed to taking on the persona of trying to be a great leader and, and rally your team to being a great, you know, a great team by you being a great leader. Um, and sometimes, you know, being a great leader is not having a big ego. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think sometimes the people with big egos make the worst leaders because Yes. They let their ego get in, get in the way. Um, and, you know, even with Damon, like, he, we always knew, like, this was his company. He started the company. We were like, hey, we're your team. We're, we're on a team. We're in the, you know, we're a team. So you're the captain of the ship. And, you know, we're going to follow you until the ship sinks. <laughs> but, you know, um, but, uh, not a lot, not a lot of people. Are, people, I think people take the the the, the idea of being a leader or, or someone in charge the wrong way, um, mm-hmm. and they just don't um, they don't learn how to, you know, become a great delegator. Yes. Um, they don't know how to be a good judge. Um, you know, have a good judge of character for 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 people they hire or people they they align themselves with. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and then just knowing when to push that button. And I think what made us successful and what, you know, I, I think we pushed the envelope a lot of times. Um, and being that it was four of us, we were always able to bounce ideas off each other. Like I would throw ideas out that would be just perfect for the brand. Uh, David would come in and say something that's perfect for the brand. And, you know, we had four different people who would just contribute to that all the time. So it kind of got to a point where, we were kind of all leaders in our own right, mm-hmm. but we had, you know, Dame and John as the, you know, as the big dog that we, we follow. But, you know, we're we're kind of all bosses in our own right. Awesome. But well, we let me ask. Let me ask you this then, you know, because for people, yes, that's, you know, that's extra pairs of hands. So there's always, you know, there's the upside to that when you're talking about delegation or people honing their, their own individual strengths and knowing what plays out, uh, that is of benefit to the group of you in getting what you want to get as a mutual vision launch. But, you know, four years, four years of, of no necessary guarantees, four years of, uh, you know, sometimes in, in what you've cited, things not necessarily exponentially, quickly, momentously coming to fruition and just grinding every single day. I mean, were the synergies always good between you? Were you always able to keep each other afloat and, and rising in your own game as a team and individually every single day? Or did you, did you, you know, was, was there tensions? Was there, what were the dynamics in those four years between all well, of you? The, di- the dynamics were great. You know why? Because we were doing something on our own and we were trying to build something on our own and mm-hmm. it felt so inspiring. It was like, you know, you created something. It's it's moving. You see the progress in it. You just wish you had more to add to it to get it to that next level. So once we started adding those pieces to it, it just started to just come to fruition for us. And for us, it wasn't anything about like, hey, you know, guys just always were optimistic about the whole thing from day one because you can see progress all the time. You just couldn't get over the hump. And then once we kind of got once we got that commercial that was the hump that we needed to get over because that got us our deal. And then once we got our deal, all the work that, all the hard work that we, we laid down prior to the deal wound up paying off for us to solidify that deal within mm-hmm. the first three months and as opposed to the first three years. So we never had to look back and worry about somebody taking our, our brand from us because we didn't fulfill any, you know, 
type of con- contractual uh, obligations. Um, so, you know, we 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 just ran with it. We never looked back. Like once we mm-hmm. once we signed that deal, we 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 just kept looking forward, and there was more possibilities. It was it was bigger possibilities for us. Now there was a big budget. You know, we had a very we really had like an unlimited budget. Anything that we wanted to do, Samsung wow. really co-signed for us. So it wasn't like we didn't have the financials now to do what we wanted to do. And now we can, we can make these decisions. We can put these marketing budgets together. We can throw these advertising campaigns out there and, and make it work. Mm-hmm. So Beautiful. it wasn't really anything about, you know, everybody having tension. I think just the one guy, he had tension within himself. <laughs> and, then, and then it was funny because, you know, it, it didn't always happen like this. You don't want to put in the work, but you always want to reap the reward. Exactly. And when when we got the deal, he was like, yo, we got a deal, son. And everybody looked around and was like, really? <laughs> Are you serious? You know, we were sitting there like, you can't be serious. So Damon was like, I am, he's not coming with us. And then I was like, you know what, Damon? Let's do it like this. He did put in a little work, right? Yeah. Let's give him a job for a year or two. That should cover all, you know, all the, all the little work that he did. Uh-huh. You know, we we'll pay him a regular salary. He won't be a part of the the big thing. And you know, then when that happened, he was he was upset about that. But you never put any work. And then even when he came to us in in the um, Empire State Building, he would just find him sitting in a random office with his feet on the desk all the time. So we were like, <laughs> okay, you got to go, brother. <laughs> you know. So Dead people always say, "What's Dead the old five? I was like, "What's the old five for?" Well, it started out with five of us, but he didn't make it. Right. Right. But well, we the, to, you know, well, that was generous. That was generous of you, you know, even still. But, uh, you know, people have a tendency to wean themselves out and, you know, people very clearly can see who's truly dedicated and who's a contributor. But my question to you, Keith, is when you finally crossed over, when you finally broke through that wall and you started to see the the results um how did you guys all celebrate did you did you sleep in did you finally feel like you could breathe and sleep oh man <laughs> how did we celebrate um i don't think we celebrated we really didn't celebrate uh-huh. i mean you know the numbers were great and we were like okay and everybody was getting better checks and you know damon i remember damon moving out and he bought him a couple of cars, and then he moved out of the house, and then Jay moved out of the house, and then Carl moved out of the house, and then I was like, okay, I'm the last one here. <laughs> and then I came home one night, and I saw some guys, like, in the backyard, so I kept on walking, and I was like, oh, God, I got to get out of here. And then I finally got out. But we didn't celebrate until we had we got into the Macy's windows. That's wow. when we celebrated. Because we just felt like, okay, we're not going to come here now and get happy and, 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 you know, be like, oh, we made it. We don't have to do any more work now, you know. So when we came in, we, we still had that animal animal attitude, and we just kept going. We were hungry. And um, when we got into Macy's Windows and they told us that we were the first urban company that ever graced the windows of Macy's. Wow. The first That's urban huge. company. So Huge. we were like, wow. And then at the time, I think we were like still drinking beer and whatnot. So <laughs> we kind of like, we kind of like pulled up in front of Macy's one day and blasted the radio and our new cars and got out, and popped a couple of beers and toasted. And then we stood there for maybe about an hour and a half, two hours, just wow. sitting there, just looking at the windows and drinking. Like, wow, you made it, bro. <laughs> and wow. I think that was our first major celebration. Beautiful. I just After that, all the celebrations are all blurred, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and, you know, celebration is in order because, I mean, it's not indicative of getting lazy. It's not indicative of getting complacent, medio- mediocre, mm-hmm. and thinking, okay, well, now that we've we've kind of climbed the echelon and we've, we've broken through, by no means is that indicative uh, in terms of rewarding yourselves or just, just embracing that moment because, I mean, finally, it all came – it all came to fruition. Your vision had been embraced. It had been globally right. embraced. And you were being celebrated for the fact that you mm-hmm. were truly, you made it. I mean, and you aspired, you aspired by not quitting. You know, you, yeah. I mean, four years, a lot of people would, would never, no matter how fiercely committed they are, 
a lot of people would just say, oh, my God, I can't do this. This is costing me my relationships with people. This is costing me everything other than what yeah. what is you know being honed and what is being solely invested into your time and energy into your dream that has not at that point yet come to fruition. So when I ask the question about celebration, by no means is that synonymous uh, for me in terms of asking the question with all of a sudden becoming complacent and thinking that that doesn't push you to the next level of your own game because of course it does. Of course yeah, it does. Yeah, but I've seen I've seen people – you know, we came in at a time when there was a lot of young guys with companies like ours come in, and we we saw a lot of people like come in and just be like, okay, you know, now they're getting a big, you know, some of these guys, and, and they were like, you know, major guys. They were getting like a hundred thousand dollars salaries, and you know, driving nice cars, and you know, you would pull up like at Magic and on a, you know, Magic was uh, the men's apparel show in Vegas, and we would be there, like, if they said be there at 8 o'clock in the morning, all four of us was there at 8 o'clock in the morning. Mm-hmm. Like, we would all be there on time, ready to rock. Like, you would see these guys coming at, like, 10, 11, you know, just dragging in. And, and we were like, you know, you know, why is this guy not, like, you know, he's slacking a little bit. And then you kind of saw it over the years, like, all of these lines kind of fall to the wayside. But, mm-hmm. at you know, and, and I was... In the beginning, you know, everyone, I mean, everyone told us we couldn't do this. We were the only four people within a handful besides us. There was a handful of people that really, you know, like my mother, his mother, you know, all of our mothers, our families and stuff like that. Not not even like my whole family, but a couple of, you know, members of my family, a couple of members of each of our, each, each of our families believed that we can do it. And we just kind of held on to that because all our friends – most of our friends were like, man, you want to have a clothing company? You know how hard that is? Are you kidding me? You don't know you guys? Oh, man, get out of here. You know, so that kind of motivated us, too, because we wanted to show everybody that we, we had what it took to, to get it done. But never in our wildest dreams <laughs> did we ever realize that this thing would be as big as it. Not, I don't know what I mean telling you. I mean, from the Essence Award to the Congressional Awards to, mm-hmm. you know, like we have literally hundreds of awards throughout the years. And each of us has about maybe 40, 40, 50 of them at home, you know, and we, we sit there and we look at it. And then, you know, you talk about wax figures of us you know, <laughs> done in, in, in museums. Then you talk about us being inducted into the Smithsonian. And yeah. like, I'm just like, I, I just sit here sometimes and, and I'm, I just look up at God and like, wow, I didn't know you had all of this for me. I didn't know my life was, you know, Beautiful. just well planned out, you know. Mm-hmm. So, Beautiful. you know, Damon's running around. He's a presidential ambassador or was a presidential ambassador under Obama. And you look at that, he's running around with the president of the United States. Like, mm-hmm. you know, and then you have the president of the United States quoting your company's logo. <laughs> and I'm like, amazing. or slogan. And I'm like, wow, this is this is amazing. So, you know, and, and it hasn't stopped. And, then, you know, Damon just got a NAACP award. Um, Carl, he's working on um, a hotel, a couple of hotels. Um, mm-hmm. Jay is uh, working on building Fubu TV. Um, I'm, you know, obviously I have the radio station that I'm working on. So we're just trying to take, you know, our brand into a different direction. You know, maybe digital media, and then become an, another conglomerate another way, as opposed to just clothes. Um, you know, we have. Uh, phones coming out, cellular phones coming out uh, in a couple of months. Wow. So, you know, we just, you know, we just launched the brand again. Um, we're putting together the brand. Uh, we have a a lot of stores who are interested now, and it's kind of giving us a little hiccup, but it's a good hiccup because what we wanted to do and now what they're kind of forcing our hand to do is, is a good thing. So, you know, there's a great possibilities coming up, and, and, and they're still coming. So it's like, you know. We, we we never thought it, and then we, we just celebrated our 25th year in business. Congratulations! So just, yeah, thank you. It's just, beautiful. It's just, it's what a beautiful a story. Feeling. What a beautiful story. I mean, talk about inspiration. Talk about stepping into it. Talk about owning your greatness. Uh, this mm-hmm. is all. This is all yummy stuff. I'm all about the yummy stuff. And um, right. you know, so did all, did all those previous naysayers come circling the wagons and come back full circle? Oh, we knew you of would course, do it. Geez. Of course. 
<laughs> of course, of course. Yeah, they they all wanted jobs. We didn't yeah. give them any jobs. Um, they all wanted to travel and and roll with us all the time. And we kind of picked and chose when you know we needed them or we wanted them around. You know, um, but we did take a lot of people who you know, a couple of our friends and 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 uh, supporters, and gave them a lot of jobs and you know, fed a lot of families, sent a lot of kids to colleges and, you know, so I'm very proud of that. Like, you know, and then you have so many people that were around you. And then as soon as, uh, as soon as the, uh, the ship looked like it was sailing, everybody started jumping off. So we were (laughs) like, wow, like, do you hear from so-and-so anymore? You're like, no, I don't hear from him anymore. Wow. You know, this guy was with us for, for 12, 15 years and now you don't hear anything. He doesn't call you. He doesn't, you know, but it, it's good. Like, it, it to me, it weeded out all the people who really didn't need to be around us. Absolutely. Anymore. Absolutely. And then now we're doing, and dealing with the, the Shaw Group and being a celebrity uh, branding person for the, for, the, for the company, you know, I'm kind of still doing what I was doing at FUBU, but I'm doing it for different companies and coming up with different ideas and just introducing them in a different way. You know, rather than, hey, put on this shirt and wear this shirt. So it's, um, you know, and forming alliances with different celebrities and influencers. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of, I like this. I really like this a lot. Like, this is um, much more challenging, um, even though the, the the clothing was really challenging because you had to design something that people was going to, that what they wanted to buy, that, you know, that would buy it every each and every season. So that was kind of, you know, a little demanding, you know, yeah. and, and challenging. But this here is a little different, and I kind of, I still get to kind of work with the clothes in a sense, and, you know, the celebrities and these new companies and building new ideas and coming up with different things and strategies. And so it, it, it's, it's good. I mean, we're in a good space right now. Love it. Well, what I'll say is back in the day, long before uh, what you would glean is my reinvention process of being a TV radio show host, author, etc. I used to work in social services and I used to work in group homes and foster homes for adolescents. And uh, right. I, I tell you, every, every time I took them clothing shopping with their money every month, it was FUBU this, FUBU that. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my introduction to FUBU. It was my clientele who I worked what with at the time. FUBU? <laughs> <laughs> what is a FUBU? Who cares? It's cool. It's cool. And I need to have it. And this came out and this came out and I got to keep up with the trends. So yeah. I have to, I have to say as a, as you know it's it's funny how things come full circle in your life because here I am introducing or speaking with you on radio long before I ever would have known that I would have been on radio and long before you know our paths ever would have crossed and you know here Correct. we are it's like a full circle moment indirectly based on the kids I used to work with who absolutely ate up your stuff like like candy it was crazy but um so, you know, in terms of my brand living fearlessly, Keith, and I mean, your whole, your whole story, your whole journey truly speaks to that. But if you could crystallize it for myself and the listeners, what does living fearlessly mean for you? What's that indicative of? Um, you got to go for it. You know, a lot of people have, have a, this fear of failing mm-hmm. and not knowing that you learn from failing. Like there's a, there's a lesson to be learned from failing. So don't be afraid. You know, like I got, I got family. Um, I won't say which family, so they don't get too, uh, you know, hot and bothered about me telling this story. <laughs> okay. But you know, my family, I have a family member who was really, really intelligent, who was really smart, who really took like this leadership position early on in his life. And, then kind of got caught up with, with some, you know, a female and then kind of let that go by the wayside and didn't really, you know, didn't really pursue his, his dream. He kind of let his dreams go to the side. And a lot of times I tell him like, listen, you know, you, your mind, your mindset, you know, you were doing this at 10, 11 years old, you know, when you were 17 years old, 16 years old, you were like running your own little company. You know, it wasn't anything formal, but you still was running your own little company. You know, everything that I gave him, he took it and and, and built on it and 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 just took it to the next level. And sometimes I, I feel like he's 
scared of failing now. Like mm-hmm. he, he stepped out of that and now he's scared to fail. So he doesn't try um, to achieve all of these other things that he's great at. You know, he likes to get to stick to one thing. Like if he, if he liked one thing before he, he stopped doing it, then he does something else. And then if he likes that, then he'll do that for a while when he's great at all these things together, like he can do them all, mm-hmm. but his mind is not a hundred percent focused on what he should do to get to that next level. And then every time I have a conversation with him, I get frustrated because I'm like, dude, I've been talking to you for like five, six, seven years, man. He let five, <laughs> six, seven years go by yep. and you're not listening. I mean, he, he says he's listening, but I'm like, okay, if you're listening, then you have to start applying because you know, life is short. Like you think, you know, life is, oh, I got years and exactly. you, know, you don't have that many years, you know. And then once you get onto something, it's how long is it going to take you to perfect that to actually get that off the ground? So it's a lot of things that you have to think about. But um, I just think that that living fairly is just going for, for what you want, you know, what you want in life and not being afraid to fail. Mm-hmm. You know, because that, that will hinder, that hinders, I ain't going to say that will hinder, that hinders a lot of people. I Absolutely. really never realized how many people are afraid to fail. And now with social media, it's like you're failing in front of everybody. So they're mm-hmm. really afraid to fail. They're mm-hmm. really afraid to stick their nose out there. And then, you know, and I don't, I don't, I don't know why, you know, I've, I've always jumped at every opportunity, whether I thought I was going to be successful at it or not. Um, and I failed at, at a couple of things, you know, I tried to do a couple of things and it just wasn't for me and I didn't have the right team around me. I tried to do it by myself, whatever it was, it just didn't work. So I know what I'm good at and I know my lanes and I try to stick to those things. And, you know, if something else comes, comes by that I feel like, uh, you know, I can get down and I could be, you know, I can make it happen. Then I, mm-hmm. I try to make it happen. But you know, I just think people need to let go of that fear and, you know, just take that leap of faith more often. Absolutely. And, you know, there's an expression out there. It's not my terminology. You know, it's very hard to come up with a unique uh, concept uh, or word or phrase, but uh, fail forward, you know, just fail forward yeah. and, and pick fail yourself forward. back up again and, you know, recalibrate, reconfigure some things, sort things out, get it more exceptionally clear and step into it and step into it with the newfound knowledge of what to do differently. It doesn't mean it has to eradicate you from still having the same dream. You just apply mm-hmm. it differently. You just apply it yeah. differently. You know, I, I often I talk about with my guests, you know, we get in our own way. It's not the external stuff out there, the the intangibles. We we have a tendency as human beings to implode ourselves, to self-sabotage. And, you know, it's it's unfortunate because so many people, I think, would be at a more elevated, higher level of consciousness and happiness and pure joy if people could just take all the other stuff, call it people's judgments, people's criticisms, people's whatever, and just say, screw it. I mean, those people aren't your tribe anyway. They're not your tribe. If they don't support you and sit back and let you soar and do whatever you want to do, whether it's, you know, uh, aligned with what their li- life is, their their passions, their goals, whatever. I mean, you know, as much as we're fundamentally the same, we're also uniquely different and we need to be able to embrace that. And if we can't say anything nice or supportive, just back off. You know, get yeah. off the grid. Get off the grid. So well, I think um, social media has a lot to do with that too. You know, because now you have people who have a who voice their opinions who are really not opinion worthy. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, like I I see that all the time, and, and it's almost a form of bullying. You know, if you ask me. Yes. But um. You know, if you are an expert in that field or you have some knowledge in that field or you have some proving, you know, ability that, okay, I've, I've done business in this field or I've, I've worked in this field and I've, I've made it and I've achieved some things, mm-hmm. then fine. And I can listen to you and kind of gauge what, you know, your opinion and see what I want to take from it or not. But when you have somebody who's sitting on the couch <laughs> who hasn't had a job in <laughs> five years, and then sitting there telling you what a what a a hole you are yes. for leaping out on faith trying to do something that hasn't been done, and you're looking like, who are you to tell me right. that I cannot do something when 
you're not doing anything with yourself. Like I, I just sometimes yeah. I just hate that, and I hate that people have the 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 ability to just go right there and just say whatever they want to say. Yeah. To me, is it, it, it gets you know if you're gonna say like you said if you're gonna say something say something nice and you can't say something nice or say nothing at all, but people don't Absolutely. you know everyone doesn't agree with that. They have Absolutely. to stick their nose in things that they have you know no business sticking their nose in. Yeah, well, I mean, you can probably attest to this too. You know, when it comes to business, there's nothing, you know, you take everything that you do because of your investment and it being about your soul and your blood, sweat and tears. And it's a very personal thing. But when it comes to other people's opinions and other people sitting on the fence, really waiting for you to silently fail, I mean, you know, you just, you just got to just forget that. You just got to be the disruptor that you are. You've got to be the leader that you are. You've got to hone your belief. You've got to hone your passion and just track and just just go. And, uh, you know, so, and, and we're all operating at different levels of self-awareness. So when, when, when you get the critics and you get the naysayers, it's not that they're not entitled to their opinion. It's, it's the fact that they're operating from their own filter. And so rather than pointing the finger and waiting for somebody else to fail, because it's a mirror of perhaps how you feel inadequate in your own life, or you feel like you should be doing more, but you don't quite know how to step into it. So rather than working on yourself and evolving yourself, let's just throw stones at people and, and, and hope that that takes them down a notch. But, um, you know, I, I've learned not to personalize that stuff. There's always going to be people who, you know, truly want the best for you, have your best interest at heart and only want to see you succeed and however you choose to define that for yourself. And then unfortunately there's another sector of population where because of their own inability to, as you say, get off the couch and start making some advancements and some true changes in their own lives. Um, you know, the, we have that kind of riff with energies with people, unfortunately, vibrationally. But anyway, right. I'm, I'm cognizant of time here. And unfortunately we've, we've got three minutes, which really means enough since we've got about two or one and a half. So Keith, okay. I want to thank you. I want to thank you very much for the gift of your time. I want to thank you for all the nuggets that you've imparted to all of us. I've certainly derived a lot of additional insights and uh, inspiration from you. You're, you're kick-ass. I think you're doing a great thing. Um, where can people find you again? Um, well, you can find me on Instagram at Kizo, K-E-E-Y-Z-O. Um, I'm on Twitter at uh, Mr. Kizo. K E E Y Z O, and um, I'm on Facebook at Keith C. Perrin Jr. That's Perrin with two R's. Fantastic. Well, no doubt you'll be ramping up some additional things, and maybe we bring you back onto radio to enlighten the listeners as to what else is new that's going on in your world. Um, would love okay. that. I would be totally honored. Uh, but well, for our time, yeah, but for our time today, I want to say thank you very much, uh, for the gift of your time. I know you're an off the, the charts busy man with your hands in a lot of pockets and, and always reaching beyond the skies. So thank you for your time. And to the listeners, I want to thank you very much for taking time out of your schedule to once again join me here. I go live every Friday. My show is Living Fearlessly with the Contact Talk Radio Network. I want to thank you again for being over 140,000 podcast subscribers to Living Fearlessly over on iTunes and for your ongoing loyal listenership. Couldn't be doing this without you. So once again, I wish everybody a fantastic, safe weekend. Love and gratitude to all. Take care and continue to live fearlessly. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. You've been listening to Living Fearlessly with your host, Lisa McDonald. Visit her at lisamcdonaldauthor.com.